Hi, everyone. Um, just while we're waiting for the last few people to uh, join the call today, I just wanted to remind you that uh, this call is being recorded and uh, we are keeping the um, video and microphone capabilities turned off. If you have questions for Helen during this session, please use the chat function. Um, and we will be conducting a poll in the session as well, just to see where everybody is from. So when that poll starts, if you're not able to access it, to answer it, um, we're just looking to, uh, to find out where everyone is from. So if you're not able to access the poll features, you can just type it in the chat box as well. Thank you so much. And again, uh, we're just admitting the last few people into our session and then we will get started. Okay, so thank you um, for joining us today. We are so excited um, to have you uh, part of our first virtual CD Saturday, now uh, being called Halton Garden Week. Um, this session is uh, being hosted by Helen Stevenson, who is the uh, Community Garden Coordinator for Halton Food for Oakville, Milton, and Acton. So she's got lots of responsibilities. And uh, with nearly 200 square feet of vegetable gardens in her own backyard, a certificate in horticulture from the University of Guelph and soon to be diploma, plus a degree in biology from the University of Waterloo, she's got quite uh, extensive knowledge in sustainable urban agriculture. Um, Helen joined Halton Food Council, which is now um, Halton Food in 2017, um, but she's been leading the junior gardening program through the Oakville Horticultural Society for many years um, in addition to this experience. Her talk today is all about food forests and how to get one started in your community. So welcome Helen, my coworker, awesome teammate, and I will turn it over to you now. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to speak. <laughs> so welcome to my talk on food forests. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. And while you're doing that, I will start the poll so that we can get a feel for who is joining us today. Um, so we just want to know um, what town you are from, if you are from Halton region, so Oakville, Burlington, Milton, Halton Hills. If you're one of our neighbors, are you uh, joining us from Peel region or Hamilton um, or somewhere else in Ontario or Canada? We uh, had some people joining us from the United States this morning. Unfortunately, we don't have that option in our poll, but if you are joining us from outside of Canada, we wanna know that too. So use the chat feature, let us know where you are from, and uh, I will turn it back over to you, Helen. I see you're ready to go. Yes, all right. So is everything set up properly on your end there? So that's good. Yep, we're seeing everything. Right, so, uh... First, a bit about me, as Andrea did mention quite a few things. Uh, my name is Helen Stevenson. And um, yes, as she said, I joined the Halton Food Council, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating a sustainable food system in 2017. Last year, the Halton Food Council board disbanded and in its place, Halton Food was created under the Halton Environmental Network banner. Halton Food staff work in outreach and education, teaching others about urban agriculture. We maintain 10 and counting community gardens across the region. As you can see from the pictures, we also hold cooking classes and do community outreach with seniors and children. I wrote a blog on food forests for Halton Food. Uh, you can check it out on our website, haltonfood.ca, in September of 2020. Since then, we were able to secure a small piece of land in Southeast Oakville where we could create and plant our own food forest to serve the community. The plan is to start planting this spring and there was a lot of work that needed to be done to get to that stage. So through this talk, I'm going to take you on that journey. The first thing though is what is a food forest? So if you search food forest on the internet, many definitions come up, but basically they all come down to the same thing. Food forests are sustainable, edible food systems that in theory require no weeding, spraying or digging. So I'll expand on that later. Since they are permanent, food forests encourage greater biodiversity than simple backyard vegetable gardens, which are cleaned up each fall in preparation for winter. So for example, imagine a bird's nest in an apple tree. 
Each spring, the bird lays its eggs in that nest, and within a few weeks, the babies are born. As they grow, they are fed the pesky caterpillars that are trying to eat the apple trees, leaves, and fruit. So as you can see, that type of ecosystem wouldn't happen in a regular food garden. Before we get too far though, how about, um, how about that unusual word fedge? What does that mean? <laughs> it's a food hedge. So it's kind of a funny little word, isn't it? My husband loves it so much that he wants a fedge simply so he can go around telling people he has a fedge. Uh, fedges are made up of many species or they could be multiples of one species. So the picture on the left is an elderberry fedge. So shrubs make a natural choice. Uh, so think raspberries, service berries, currants, but espaliered fruit trees also work as you can see from the picture on the right. Beyond their use for food, fudges, fedges can be used as windbreaks or for privacy. So what is the difference? Why would one opt for a fedge over a food forest? Well, it depends on what kind of space is available for planting. So maybe you need to keep the grass portion of a property, but you can mark the boundary line with plants. And, um, and that is when you would use a fedge rather than say a chain link fence or maybe some other plant that may not benefit our native wildlife species. So what does that mean? So if you saw um, Sean James's talk earlier in the day, then he mentioned that an oak tree supports 500 different species compared to the Norway maple, which only feeds two species in Canada. So another example, I have two old apple trees in my backyard that I've long since neglected. But that being said, every year when my apples um, get ripe, I get an amazing array of wildlife coming into my yard to eat them, including the birds filling the branches. And I know that they're not eating just the fruit because in the 10 years that I have had these trees, or that I've lived here, that these trees have been growing, I have never had a problem with insects or caterpillars, and it's just it's just doubtful that I'm that lucky. So my point is, it's better to use edible native species to field wild, food, wildlife, and one of the ways you can do this is through veggies. So back to food forests. Um, food forests are designed to mimic a tree forest, with plant material growing in multiple layers and directions. Each layer supporting the other, as well as allowing for wildlife to live within the system. Multiple layers means high density, which translates into high productivity and prolonged food supply, much longer than an average vegetable garden. Leaves, flowers, and ground covers are allowed to decompose on site, adding to the biomass and eliminating the need for fertilizers. The soil is left undisturbed, allowing for better water absorption and reduced runoff. Plants are encouraged to spread, ensuring little to no bare soil, elim eliminating the problems of weeds and soil erosion. By the time a food forest becomes established, the soil is teeming with beneficial insects, bacteria, and fungi, all of which help the plants grow and thrive. A true ecological community. Sounds ideal. So how would you start a food forest? So a food forest can be as large as several acres or as small as a suburban front yard. It really all depends on how much space, money, time, volunteers, or employees you have. If you live in the country, land is abundant. If you live in the city, a food forest may be a patch of land between two buildings. Like any garden, you could just plant a few fruit trees and shrubs, put an understory plant, maybe a vine, and be done with it. But as all of you know, a little bit of planning will make the project successful for years to come. Generally, there are five to seven layers to a food forest. The canopy layer, smaller fruit trees, uh, like the dwarf trees, shrubs, herbaceous or perennial layer, ground cover crops, and vines or climbers. In order to be successful, it helps to know what grows well with what and what can do well in shade or part shade. So I'm gonna keep coming back to the theme of researching what you want to plant. To begin, start by clearing a patch of land of all existing vegetation. So initially compost or mulch will be needed to replenish the soil with valuable nutrients. Another method is to put down cardboard to smother the grass or weeds and then cover that with mulch. Research which plants and tree species are suitable to your soil and climate conditions. And then consider how big each tree and shrub will become and provide ample room for them to grow. You do want your forest to become densely vegetated over time. 
plant the faster growing plants first and be sure to include any plants that will improve the soil like clover. Then add the fruits or nut trees and then add, then start planting in layers, the trees, the shrubs and the ground covers to increase the amount and diversity of food available for harvest. So some species to uh, consider are the ultra northern pecan tree, the pawpaw tree, hazelnut, the ground nut, and nodding wild, on wild onion. By the way, during my research, I discovered Canada has many food forests. Quitchen, BC, Toronto, Sudbury, London, Red Deal, Alberta, the list goes on. There's even one in Hay River Northwest Territories. So geography cannot be used as, as an excuse to not plant one. Also, food forests are not a new concept. There are thousands of food forests all over the world, including a 70 or 65 acre one in Morocco. In tropical regions, many people today earn an income harvesting food from a food forest. Using forest to grow food is probably the oldest form of land use by humans. Over time, humans would have identified which trees and plants could feed us. And so we protected and improved those plants at the expense of less desirable plants. Plants that could feed livestock were added and the manure from the animals fertilized the soil. So the goal was to create a self-sustaining system that required little labor, but could feed people year round unlike industrial farms that concentrate are one on one or two crops already at the same time. In 1980, an Englishman called Robert Hart, his picture is on the left there, coined the term forest gardening after observing the interactions and relationships that take place between plants and natural systems. He was inspired by such systems in India and Japan. P.K. Nair is an Indian agronomist who pioneered a new field of agricultural sciences, agroforestry, which is essentially what a food forest is. But it was Jeff Lawton, the picture on the right, who brought the idea to the mainstream. Jeff wanted to show the world that a food forest is possible anywhere, literally anywhere, including the middle of the desert in Jordan, which is what this picture is here. So to quote Lawton about this site, this was the toughest project I've ever worked on. The site was 400 meters below sea level. Midsummer temperatures rose to 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Soils were salty. Rain forage, rainfall averaged less than six inches per year. Nothing of this nature had ever been attempted. And this is a picture of that same site uh, of nine years later. Like, it's just amazing. This 1.75 acre plot is open to the public. Inside, there are more than 40 species of fruit and nut trees, and depending on the season, upward of 100 varieties of herbs and vegetables. It has been so successful with locals and city officials that an additional five and a quarter acres have been slated for development. So I just want to show you that again, just that before and after. So there's your before, complete desert, and there's your after. So back to our little corner of the woods and comparing this site to that last one, I really have nothing to complain about. So our specific journey started when Halton Food managed to secure a piece of town property in Southeast Oakville. Currently the space is a large grassy area on a slight slope just north of a dog park and just south of an allotment garden. The park is very large and it supports multiple walking paths and soccer fields. This particular section of the park that you're looking at here isn't used for very much. There was a community orchard on the site, but it was abandoned years ago and has become overgrown with weeds. You can see this as the darker green area on the left. Three fruit trees and six current shrubs are all that remain. Oakville Green, a nonprofit organization that works towards protecting the natural environment in Oakville, had originally asked uh, for the entire space to create a pollinator pathway but fortunately for us, they decided to share the space. I know we were happy uh, to share because the size of it was starting to become slightly daunting. And I admit the dimensions don't sound very big, 500 square meters, but when you consider how many plants you'll need to fill that, well, it's, it started to feel like a lot. <laughs> Here's a, a couple of pictures of the site as we found it last fall. So you can see the weeds, a lot of goldenrod and teasel. A few asters, you can see that's the purple flower in the front there. The tall trees at the back are oak trees and they're gonna border our food forest once it's fully planted. Excuse me. They're on the west side, so that's also gonna create quite a bit of shade. 
I should mention that the town just didn't walk up to us and say, you know what this town needs? It's a food forest. We had to sell them on the idea and, and suggest, and it was, help, we was really glad that this orchard was um, in the state it was because it helped us convince them that all it needed was a little bit of revitalization. The first thing we needed to do after finding the land was secure some money. Halton Food applied for two grants, the TD Friends of the Environment grant and the TD, or sorry, the Tree Canada grant. But that also meant we had to do our research on what species we wanted. So if you've ever filled out a grant, you will know that they expect you to have a plan, not just a dream. The TD grant is very restrictive. They only allow money to be given towards native plants. So we tried to keep as many species native to Ontario as possible. The first thing you need to do if the food forest isn't on private property is figure out why you were doing it. Is it to fight food insecurity? Is it an example of sustainable farming? Is it a teaching garden to supply food banks? The list of reasons is endless, but it's important to decide on and stay with one main reason. It'll keep you focused as the rest of the plan comes together. We decided to use this space as a teaching garden. Our plan is to teach homeowners how to plant and maintain fruit trees. I would love to see as many people as possible grow fruit in their backyard. I think it would bring neighbors together as they traded extra fruit, as well as have the health benefits of having people eat more fruit. It may encourage people to grow more of their own produce, produce at home, which leads to more health and climate benefits. And this is actually part of the reason that the entire food forest doesn't exclusively use native species. So um, after eight years of experience teaching others how to grow their own food, I know people generally don't try things outside their comfort zone unless they have to, or unless they have help. So if you think about it, like people might think, an apple tree in my backyard, oh, I heard that requires pruning and I don't know how to do that. So you know what, grass is just easier. So our plan, once the food forest is established, will to be include workshops that will walk residents through the basics of pruning. So our goal is to empower residents to grow their own. For the grant, we needed to not only know what species we were going to plant, but how much we could harvest and when. So I was extremely fortunate that I happened to be taking a horticultural course at the University of Guelph that spelled out everything we needed to know before starting this project, which is where this list you see here comes from. I'm not gonna bore you by going through all the details, um, but I do want you to note a couple of things if you're going to start one of your own. Know your soil, know how the project will be irrigated and make an inventory of the equipment you have or you're going to need. Also do a call before you dig, before for a starting, we happen to be very near an Enbridge gas line. Little side note about grants. Uh, we knew about the Tree Canada and TD Forest Friends of the Environment grant from previous projects. But if you are new to grant writing, try canplant.ca. Uh, so not everything's gonna be applicable to a large outdoor space like that, but there are some useful grants for schools or for homeowners. So you might find something there to help you out if it's something you want to establish. Um, and as you can see, it has Canada-wide opportunities and province-specific opportunities. The town of Oakville is extremely supportive of our project. They generously offered to till the land for us. And if you recall from the initial photo of this site, I'm sure you will think about what we have really done and that's tilled in hundreds of teasel plants and their seeds. So I realized we're gonna might have a huge weed problem if we can't plant this coming spring. So fingers crossed the COVID restrictions are eased. Because there are food forests in all parts of Canada and the world with different zones and climate conditions, there wasn't a set list of species we could choose from. Southeast Oakville is in a small zone 6B pocket, but this space is very open and windy. And so we're not gonna count on anything that's hardy to just zone six. It is typical to have a nitrogen fixer like honey locusts and wild blue indigo, neither of which are edible. And while some people can turn acorns into flour, we added burr oak more for the value it gives wildlife species than for a food source. We were hoping the hazelnuts will produce nuts, but as I mentioned previously, if we have to pick native varieties over European varieties, um, we might not get very tasty or large nuts. European varieties, in case you didn't know, tend to be bigger and tastier. The soil is clay loam, but most of these species are not fussy about soil type. 
The species in bold are the native species we would like to add. We will have to plant multiples of some of these species as many of them need a pollinator uh, nearby. We did not add a lot of flowers that will attract pollinators simply because the pollinator pathway is going to be right beside this garden. If that wasn't there, that would be something to consider adding. We may also add herbs such as mint if we need a quick ground cover, but her as well, anybody who has grown mint knows that it's quite invasive. So we'll have to kind of think long and hard about that one. This is the basic layout for our food forest. Um, the dark burgundy is paths that we are creating for visitors or harvesters to walk through. So that's also a point to consider. Make sure your harvesters can get in uh, there to glean the fruit. We hope to have a gazebo, so that's that little black square at some point. I think it would be lovely to sit there looking out over the pollinator pathway with the forest at your back. So, so far everything sounds great, right? Unfortunately, there's so much that could derail this plan or any food forest. So I visited Gabor Sass, he's the picture there in the center, he's in London in the fall. He started two food forests in his community and he provided me with a lot of advice, which I'll pass on here. The number one thing one needs to do before starting a project like, like this, and I mentioned it at the start of the presentation, is to think about why you were doing this. So for Gabor, he could promote sustainable living, which includes growing your own food. His entire front yard is a mini food forest. So he thought he would promote homegrown food with a food forest in his neighborhood park. What his local food forest has actually become is a neighborhood hub. When volunteers came out uh, for the initial planting, they introduced themselves to each other and formed friendships. Since then, the park has added new features to keep the hub alive, such as a gazebo, a weekly community concert series in the summer, a permanent barbecue, and so on. So it turned an out of the way little park at, park, it's like a park at really, into something very special for that community. So for Gabor, the purpose of the food forest was to create community. So can a food forest actually feed people? Yes and no. I wrote up a chart to determine what the potential yields would be for some of the species. As you can see, most trees and shrubs will take years to become established. I can buy bigger, more mature trees to get fruit faster, but that of course adds to the initial startup cost. My advice would be to consider food gleaning a bonus. A neighbor happened to come out while Gabor and I were talking when I was visiting his food forest in London. And while he fully supported the project, he convinced there has been very little food gleaned during the past five years. Mice or squirrels eat most of the strawberries, birds eat the other berries and nuts and so on. To be fair, that food forest was quite small, but subsequent research has suggested food forests don't really solve the problem of food insecurity. What they do do, for, however, is promote food sovereignty. So food sovereignty is the right of people to access culturally acceptable food. So basically, it's the right to define one's own food and agricultural system. So I've mentioned this word food insecurity a few times. So it's important to define that term. According to the government of Canada, food insecurity is the inability to acquire or consume an adequate diet quality or sufficient quantity of food in socially acceptable ways, or the uncertainty that one would be able to do so. Food insecurity can range from marginally food insecure, so the worry that you're going to run out of food before the next paycheck comes in, to severe, when one must skip meals in order to get by. Food insecurity might not be obvious. It might occur as a food desert where people must travel considerable distances to find an affordable grocery store or as food um, swamps. So that's areas where there seems to be a lot of food but the choices are unhealthy and the food is heavily processed. As you can see here, these are some pretty shocking statistics when it comes to food insecurity in Canada. The situation has been made worse due to COVID this past year. I believe in Halton, the statistic is now one in seven families are food insecure. So it's important to think of ways to feed our communities. Food forests, for reasons I mentioned previously, may not be the solution by themselves, but the goal is to encourage people to become more connected to the land and to know where food comes from. It is to give people the skills and confidence to grow their own food. 
and that may be one solution for food insecurity. It is my job to teach others to grow their own food. And for me, there's no bigger reward than when families tell me they started a vegetable in their backyard. I especially love it when they tell me they didn't realize vegetables could taste that good. And if you've ever bought tomatoes in the winter and compared them to ones you've grown in your own garden, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So returning to the issue of creating a food forest and how do you decide what species to use? The plants you pick will ultimately determine how much work you need to do to maintain them in the future. Fruit trees like apple, pear, plum may produce a reliable amount and seem like an obvious choice, but they absolutely need to be pruned and they most likely need to be sprayed, which is counter to what a food forest is supposed to be. On the other hand, if you use only native species in your food forest and the recipients of the food have no idea what a husk dip or an elderberry is, you will have an uphill battle trying to convince people to take the fruit. And that might sound like a strange thing to say, but there was a time at one of my teaching gardens when a woman threw a whole crop of potatoes thinking they were rotten. They weren't. They were Russian blue potatoes. So they're blue by design, not by disease. So it's funny now, but it shows you that if you, but that if it doesn't look like it came from, came from Percinos or Longos, then people might not take a chance on it. Another point to make if you're setting up a food forest is to make sure you have access to water. Most likely food forest sites might not have running water or a well. So there are ways to deal with this. At our site, we've been promised rain barrels that the town will fill as needed. It does mean hand watering trees and all the plants. And however well-intentioned volunteers are, we all know that most people don't have the time, inclination or desire to give a plant more than one watering can worth of water, regardless of how dry the soil is. I have asked for tree watering bags as part of the grant fund, so hopefully that will help. Fortunately, if the forest comes together as it should, a lot of the trees and shrubs will not require ongoing irrigation. Again, though, this comes down to, comes down to what species are chosen. For the food forest in London by Gabor Sass, he told me that they have never watered that garden in the past five years. So it is possible to forego irrigation once the plants are established. A must for any food forest uh, is a must for any food forest grown on public land is a champion. You need someone who will coordinate volunteers who will assist with maintenance and keep an eye on the health of the forest. The number one reason this type of project falls apart is when no group or individual steps up to take ownership over the space. It gets weedy and then it becomes an eyesore and then people think it will take too much time to fix it and it snowballs from there. And if you do use volunteers, the advice I was given was let them experiment with all aspects of the project. As long as they don't kill the tree, um, let them make mistakes. So it's kind of a funny, but remember that scene in Karate Kid when Daniel is given the bonsai tree from Mr. Miyagi? Daniel is convinced he will damage or kill the tree. Mr. Miyagi will not take no for an answer. He tells Daniel, just close your eyes, imagine a tree and go from there. I'm not suggesting you ask volunteers to close their eyes and start chopping away, but if the tree is unbalanced, who cares? Most people don't know they've made a mistake until they've seen that they've made a mistake. So, like I said, as long as they don't kill the tree, let them experiment without micromanaging. There's that bonsai tree with Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. And speaking of volunteers, how many do you need? And do you need to become a full-time farmer to manage the site? Well, it depends on the size of your project, but you need enough people that the food forest, as it becomes established, it's watered at the beginning. And at least once a week, have someone come by and it's inspect the trees and do a little bit of weeding. Remember, everybody wants to volunteer at first, but come the dog days of August, it will be tumbleweeds and crickets. Protocols should be established for deciding where any fruit gleaned will go. I have run shared community gardens before and I find one of two things happens in that situation. Either one person takes all the fruit and no one, uh, or no one takes any of the food thinking they are being generous to the others and it gets left to rot. So personally, I think it's fair to split between the volunteers and a food bank. But as I said at the beginning, it depends on why you were doing this. So why do this? Why have a food forest? Why not plant an orchard instead? We have to start looking at the ecosystem as a whole, not as a sum of different parts. Food forests are part of the permaculture movement. 
Healthy plants require healthy soil, which in turn requires healthy microorganisms. There are so many aspects of conventional vegetable gardening and orchard maintenance that we are now realizing to be harmful. We are learning that tilling the soil is not a good practice. It destroys the microbial communities that are in our soil, which help the plants grow. So are we hypocrites ourselves for tilling this soil? Hopefully not. So we're just doing it the once and it was to break apart the hard soil and get it ready for planting. And we don't ever intend to till again. Uh, couldn't we just renew this space as an orchard? Well, we could, but unless they are organic orchard, uh, it's an organic orchard, pesticide use can be high. The purpose of pesticides is to limit and control caterpillars, which can cause a lot of destruction, but killing caterpillars has a ripple effect. At the beginning of this talk, I told the story of a baby bird eating the caterpillars that are eating the leaves of the apple tree. So I'm going to expand on that story. According to conservationist Doug Talamay studies on backyard birds, chickadee parents need to find 350 to 570 caterpillars every day depending on the So multiply that by the 16 to 18 days it takes for the young to leave the nest. And that's a total of 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to bring a clutch of chickadees to maturity. We, we need to stop the harmful practice of spraying trees, which decreases caterpillar populations, which in turn affect bird populations. We need to get back to letting nature do the work for us. Food forests are part of the new way to garden. Have any of you watched The Biggest Little Farm? It's available on Netflix. It's an amazing story of a sustainable farm in the US. I just, I, I can't do it justice. But as an example of the biodiversity they encourage on the farm, they actually encourage coyotes onto their property because it's a natural way to control the mice and rabbits. And they brought ducks in to eat the snails that were eating the fruit trees. So it's all about sustainability. It's about increasing biodiversity. And most importantly, it's about us letting go of perfection. We've become so accustomed to perfectly perpendicular rows of crops, but the reality of this is that perfection costs us in terms of biodiversity, in terms of soil health, in terms of safe water. It's time to start thinking permanent. It's time to start thinking food forests. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. I wish we could uh, all unmute ourselves and clap. <laughs> so I will do that for everybody. If anybody else feels the same way that I do, feel free to use the emotion uh, icons at the bottom of your screen. And we do have some questions that have come in, so I will try and scroll back up through the chat. And I, um, uh, I think you've answered most of them. The, uh, the one question that came in, I believe from Feed Loop, is once the forest is established, how much effort will be required on a regular basis? So I know that you touched briefly on um, the watering needs, but what about the other aspects of the ongoing maintenance? Yeah, that's a good question. So to be quite honest, until it starts to really fill in, you will have to do weeding. And that's just to not give those invasive species uh, that you don't want in there. So something like the teasel that, um, I'm sure somebody has a use for it. I, I can't think of one offhand, but to keep those guys out, um, you need to kind of keep a ha handle on those ones. So at, at the beginning, there will be a lot of weeding. The point is though, as the ones that you grew start to multiply and start to fill in, those should edge out the, the ones that you don't want. So as time goes on less and less, a little bit more at the beginning. So the first few years to keep it under control will require a little bit more effort. So what's a little more effort? So I think if you had, well, an area that I showed you, 500 square meters, maybe if you had two people once a week go in and do a little bit of weeding, you should be able to keep that under control. Nobody has asked the question, but I know that you and I have been talking about um, once the food starts to become available, there's a, a movement, I'm gonna start coughing, one moment. <laughs> talk about gleaning <laughs> gleaning 
is a word. So it's, <laughs> um, it's about picking the fruit off um, the trees. So that is, I'm not sure where she wanted me to go with this one, but you know what, once, um, so I helped the Oakville Horticultural Society at their junior garden, and that's behind the municipal greenhouses on Cornwall. And there's a big service berry tree out front that actually belongs to the town. And I had a mother and her kids pull up once and say, can I pick all the berries off this service berry? And I thought, well, I would say yes. I don't think the town would have a problem with it. But it shows you that we, we waste a lot of that kind of food. And yes, absolutely, the birds need it and we need to, need to share. I wouldn't strip it clean. The point is to, uh, to kind of have a good balance. But we need to, um, it, we let a lot of stuff go to waste. So if anybody's been to Spain, especially in the south, you'll know that all their street, uh, street trees are actually orange trees. And then somebody comes in and harvests them all and they're Seville oranges. So they're used for like marmalade and that sort of thing. So people end up harvesting all this stuff. So it's important that we kind of rethink what we're using as trees, street trees or filling in in parks. Yes, we need our native species, but we could also fill in with a few edible species too. And I'm, I'm not sure what happened to Andrea. Oh, my coughing fit is over, sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm a little red. A little on my own there. <laughs> <laughs> I've had so much tea today, but yes. Um, so um, I have another question that's come in. Do you want to learn about food for, oh, there we go. She's just uh, advertising for you. Um, one of the other questions that we had um, was, do we plan to establish anything like the program that's in Toronto, but not far from the tree? And that's um, part of what I was trying to get to before I started coughing. <laughs> So I'll let you take over the, the answer for that. Um, would, are we going to copy that or just to kind of borrow ideas from it? Um, yes, uh, in short. Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> that's the plan. Hopefully. <laughs> yes, um, so we don't find out about the grants until March. So that's gonna have a major impact on what species we can buy and plant. Um, like I said, the bigger they are, the more expensive they are. And when you start small, like, you know, that chart I showed you, you're, you're waiting three to five years sometimes before you start getting, <laughs> getting some fruit. So yeah, the, the plan is to, yes, yeah, certainly borrow from, like, I'm not reinventing the wheel. So yes, yeah, so I would like to borrow some ideas that other people have done. Um, it's just a matter of, of the money. Absolutely. So the next question uh, from Alicia via feed loop has been, um, what is the most unexpected challenge in the project so far? Um, funding, <laughs> to be quite honest, it is funding. Um, I think looking in this world today, I would think the challenges of COVID and how we're going to manage volunteers if we get going. If it wasn't a COVID world, I mean, what fantasy world is that now? But um, it would be making sure that the volunteers are engaged as time goes on. So like I said, volunteers are engaged in the spring, they might be engaged at the start of the summer, they might even be engaged, engaged for the first year. But then people have lives, they move on. And, and keeping either a fresh set of volunteers in or uh, that, those same volunteers to come back, that's, that's an issue. So um, yeah, it's, it's volunteer involvement, I would say is the biggest challenge. Another question that's just come in for you um, from Heather. She says, I eat the berries from the four service berry trees at my school and people often look at me like I'm crazy. Even when I show them that they're edible, they're reluctant to try them. So yeah. I'm sure her underlying question is, how do we educate people on how to identify what's edible and um, then make that more accessible to them to start planting? Well, I think more the issue is uh, the social stigma about eating wild, wild food, uh, foraging, really. Because um, I know my husband does the same thing. We've got some wild raspberries that are growing in the edge of the forest behind us. And I go out there and pick them. And he's like, oh, put those down, put those down. I'm like, why? <laughs> Do you know what you're eating? <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and I know a lot of people like that. There was um, a wonderful podcast by Paul Taylor, who's, um, he runs the food share program in Toronto. And he mm -hmm. said growing up, he had the same issues. His mother had a vegetable garden out back. He says, I'm not touching that food. It doesn't look like the stuff that comes from the grocery store. I want nice, clean packaged food. Yeah, and it had dirt yeah, on it. Yeah, we just have to start educating people and saying, it's okay to pick food where it actually came from and not wait for somebody else to harvest it for me, someone else to clean it, someone else to wrap it in plastic and put it in a grocery store where I'm going to pay money for it. Like it's, we have to kind of rethink how, where we're getting our food from. We're, we've lost that connection that our food comes from the ground and we need to have ownership over that. Mm -hmm. We need to protect it and we need to educate others that it's it's okay to use that food right and I think you've touched upon a good point um, in in our objective with creating this space and why we've chosen to use it as a teaching garden so that we can show others things that are edible that they could potentially then plant in their own backyard so they know it hasn't been sprayed they know exactly what the plant is because we've helped them source the plant from a reputable nursery or grower they have control over it in their backyard and therefore hopefully they would then be more um, uh, willing to eat it because they know exactly what it is. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. All right, another question uh, from Alicia. Do you have issues with people complaining if you are using nut trees in your food forest? Uh, I'm sure that's an allergy question. Yes. Um, no, not for us yet. Um, because we haven't built it. Because we haven't built it. <laughs> That's the main reason. Um, so that was another piece of advice from Gabor in London. So if you're going to have a community food forest, so something that like he built in the park, let everybody have input onto what's going to grow there. That's how you're going to have better ownership over the space as well. If people feel they've made a contribution to say, well, I really wanted service berries. And so service berries were planted. Well, I really wanted, um, I, I don't know, like I really wanted uh, hazelnuts. Well, they got planted. But if you went and planted something and, you know, I had requested all these things and you didn't plant them at all, I'd feel like, well, obviously my contributions mean nothing, I'm, I'm out. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you're planting it is to get that involvement. And if you are planting it at a school, so maybe that's something to consider. Well, maybe we don't want nut trees because of allergy issues. Absolutely. And uh, in the design that you've put together for the space in question in Oakville, those oak trees are already existing and there is already a burr oak in the adjacent dog park. So we're not really introducing anything that isn't already there as far as nuts are concerned, um, but it is a good point and it does come back to your um, community engagement point. So it's a, a good uh, reinforcing question. Absolutely. All right, let me scroll through the chat here and see if there's anything that I've missed. Alicia, uh, help me out if there's anything from Feed Loop from our uh, other participants. I've been forwarding all the questions from the feed loop into Wonderful. the main Zoom chat. All right. So I guess, Helen, that wraps up the questions that are coming in. Um, a few closing remarks then, I guess. Uh, we're hoping for funding to get started soon. Yes. This is a plan. We do have a, a three-year um, collaborative agreement with the town to, uh, to take on this space. We are looking for volunteers. We want people to get involved. We want people to reach out and ask us questions. Well, you ask you questions. You're the <laughs> expert on this now. Um, anything else that you want to uh, leave our, our participants with? Oh, we've got one more question coming in for you. Hold on your, on your closing remarks. We'll be putting in a new food forest over by the Iron Horse Trail and West Ave in Kitchener this spring. Oh, fantastic. Thanks for yeah. sharing, Candice. Yeah, I think uh, get in touch with us and we'd love to share some ideas then. Um, I think. Yeah, we'll swap ideas with them. Halton? Um, not that I'm aware of. I do not believe there's other food forests on public land in Halton. So people may have them in their own backyards, that's for sure. 
but um, yeah, but and that's part of what started this conversation for us. Um, we've had a number of people reach out and ask if we personally have expertise in um, fruit tree care. And uh, a lot of people have also reached out and said, you know, I've got all of this extra produce, what do I do with it? So we do um, help to facilitate from our community gardens, people donating into the local food banks. We've got um, strong relationships through the community gardens that way. And this is one more aspect that we're hoping to bring in that if people have backyard um, trees and excess produce, that um, they now know where, that they can, where they can take that to keep it from going to waste as well. Absolutely. Okay, now any closing remarks? That sun <laughs> is coming in on my face. <laughs> um, yeah, just thank you very much for listening to my talk. I, I do hope that we can start making connections with other people who are having or growing food for us and uh, make, creating a network. There's no reason why not to. There's, um, you know, resources, if, you know, they're somewhat easy to come by, but it's, it's always great to Oh, Helen seems to be frozen. I will close out for her then, um, just until she comes back. Are you unfrozen there, Helen? I frozen? Am I frozen? Yes, sorry, you were frozen, yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, anyway, so I just wanted to thank everybody for the talk. Um, for joining us and keep looking at our schedule to see other sessions throughout the week. So thanks very much, everybody.